I'm Jeremy Harrell. I am the founder and the president of the Adoption Project. I wish that I could acknowledge everyone individually because most all of you I have had some individual meeting with in person or phone call, uh, but if I did that, we'd be here all day. So I want to say a special thank you to a few people uh, who are in the room uh, and who wrote this to join us. First, to my wife, Michelle, who um, does not know that I'm saying this, uh, but who took this leap of faith with me. She indulges all of my wild ideas. Uh, she makes sure that our kids are taken care of. She keeps me focused on why we started this in the first place, and she also serves on our policy committee. Uh, and is a really important part of that. Jennifer Donalds, our COO, she's the one who keeps the trains running on time and makes sure that I'm, uh, from a business and operational perspective, doing the things I'm supposed to be doing. Crossbridge, who's hosting us today in this uh, beautiful and relatively new building. Um, uh, Commissioner Carver Lawrence, who serves on our board of directors. To uh, Kathy Kate, Brian Katie, Jamie Simmons, who are on our Founders Committee, and were able to join us today. That's chaired by former Governor Bill Haslam. Uh, to Leslie Galarin, Emily Richards, Brittany Farrar, Lauren Webb, Lauren Toffey, and Kristen Allender, who also are here today and serve on our policy committee, which is chaired by the former First Lady, Chrissy Haslam, Governor Lee's Chief of Staff, Joseph Williams, and his team. I think most of the legislative team is here today, and we really appreciate that. Commissioner Marty Quinn and her team at DCS, Team Care Director Stephen Smith, uh, and the members of the General Assembly have been able to join us. I know I saw Senator Hale and Senator Rose and Representatives Littleton and Leatherwood. Thank you for being here. Uh, and a few others who expect to join the General Assembly next week after the voters get their final say in the matter. Uh, to Ann Waller Curtis, Zoe Sams, and Don Johnson from Stone River Group. And then finally, to all of you who are doing really hard work in the field for kids. Uh, through nonprofits and faith communities, and as caseworkers and social workers, uh, or as foster and adoptive parents. We want to recognize the work that you're doing every day to improve the lives of some of the most vulnerable kids in our state. A year ago today, literally today, uh, with encouragement from Michelle and a tremendous group of friends, I quit my job uh, where I was a partner to found the Adoption Project. We did it with a seemingly simple goal that Tennessee should be the most adoption-friendly state in the country and cast a vision that every child deserves a safe, loving, and permanent family. There were, and are, many organizations focused on services related to adoption and foster care, but no one uniquely focused on public policy to improve the system at the top. While this was born out of our own personal adoption journey, which was, uh, so you know, domestic infant adoption through voluntary relinquishment through an agency. We also knew that the foster care system was a crucial part of achieving this vision of a safe, loving, and permanent family. So I called our goal seemingly simple. <laughs> you guys get that. <laughs> you get the joke. Uh, because in reality, adoption and foster care are very complex and very complicated. They involve a tremendous amount of trauma and uncertainty. Occasionally, someone will ask, what does this symbol in your logo mean? It represents a constellation, because that's what adoption is. A constellation of people, children, biological parents, adoptive parents, siblings, aunts and uncles, grandparents, friends, and whole communities who are all affected or involved in some way or another in this complicated and traumatic and also uh, rewarding and beautiful journey that we call adoption. Another question we heard pretty early was, well, what do you mean by adoption friendly? Because that phrase means different things to different people, and it can generate heartburn for some folks based on their own experiences and perspectives. Frankly, it was a fair question. So we identified five guiding principles that are there in your program, safe, ethical, efficient, permanent, and supportive and affirming. There is more information on that on our website, adoptionfriendly.org. These principles guided our initial conversations and our continuing conversations, and they'll guide our discussion today. Essentially, we're looking to build a system that continues to operate ethically, isn't burdensome, treats all parties with dignity, 
and where children have permanence as early as possible. As I've said, this is a complex issue affecting an entire constellation of people, and there's no way we can adequately cover this in two hours. Frankly, I don't know that we can cover two days. Our intention today is to begin the public conversation at the point where needs and practice and service meet public policy, or more simply, at the intersection of policy and purpose. How can we improve public policy to make it easier to accomplish your work and truly look out for the best interests of children? So we're going to start today with Joseph Williams. Joseph, uh, you have his bio in your program, but Joseph is the chief of staff for Governor Lee. He, um, prior to joining the Lee administration, he was an attorney and a history and civics teacher in Nashville, and I'm pretty jealous of that. Uh, and um, I also know that you guys have a personal connection to adoption through uh, Palmer. So thank you, Joseph, for joining us this morning. And can we just jump right in? Is that OK? Let's do it. It's, right. it's an honor to be here. What a great room of people you've collected. <laughs> Looking out at their smiling faces, I think is a huge testament uh, not only to what you're doing and what you've done, uh, but also to our state. Uh, and you know, we not only have an array of state leaders out there from every sector, private sector, nonprofit sector, public sector, but we also have national adoption policy leaders. Some of you know the <laughs> leaders of adoption policy in Congress are in the audience today. Like, the fact, I think that is a huge testament to you recognizing a need and an opportunity to hypercharge the great things that have been done by past administrations. You know, my boss loves to say, if he were here today, I'm sure he would find a way to work in at some point in time, that government is not, cannot, and should not be the solution to the hardest problems facing society, but it has a vitally important role to play. Um, and, and I think what we see and the faces out there today are, are a perfect example of that. So thank you for having me, and I'm excited to talk. Well, thank you, sir. I, um, I know that from our conversations that you are personally, really deeply and genuinely committed to uh, adoption and foster care and child welfare. We know Governor Lee has very publicly said that he is. So uh, as we're dealing with those issues, why are they so important for Tennessee? Yeah, a, a little bit of my personal background and the governor's personal background as it relates to this. So I taught history and civics uh, at White's Creek High School, in which I had many, many students who had been a part of some combination, and unfortunately, as I'm sure we talk about today, far too often uh, there is interaction between the foster care system and the juvenile justice system. A lot of overlap between, between those kids. And I taught juniors and seniors in high school at White's Creek mm -hmm. at, at a priority high school. And so I had a lot of students who um, who were involved in those systems. And so my wife at the time uh, was working in the public juvenile public defender's office. Mm -hmm. And even though to this day I don't know, <laughs> she couldn't tell me who that overlap was, uh, she had many of my students as some of her clients at that point in time. Uh, my wife herself, if you're picking up on this, some of you in the audience know her, she's much more impressive than I am, that's for sure. Um, she also lived and served at some rural uh, orphanages in South Africa, uh, both during college and in between undergrad and law school. And uh, her empty nesting parents of 60 years old ended up adopting an orphan with healthcare special needs from South Africa. Uh, who's my brother-in-law, he's, he was on the homecoming court at Lipscomb Academy three weeks ago, uh, you know, which, which, is, which is pretty impressive. So a deep personal connection, a deep legal and policy connection in terms of my work uh, before I started working in state government, which it was one of several issues that Governor Lee and I connected on from a natural perspective and saying, this is one of those issues. It is the hardest issue to tackle in the state, and because of that, it is also the most important issue to tackle in the state. Lots of work has been done by previous administrations. We've had an opportunity to, I think, do a lot in our first term, uh, but 
and I'm sure we'll touch on this, you know, it is one of those issues I know we had hoped to have done more on by now, uh, but due to things like global pandemics <laughs> that exacerbated the biggest problems uh, facing our communities in our state, we have a lot of work still to do. Well, you, you kind of answered my next question. I know that uh, the administration is from experience. You guys are in the midst of planning for the next legislative session. Lots of competing priorities from economics to transportation. Where, uh, one more time, where does this fall within the scope of all the things uh, that you guys have to think about you're considering what next yeah. session looks like? Um, I mean, vulnerable children and families is, the area that is both touched by all the policy areas and has the biggest impact on all of them. Um, it deals with, as we've talked about a lot, uh, adoption law and adoption policy, private and public. Uh, obviously the foster care system and the Department of Children's Services, um, the juvenile justice system. I see, you know, it's a pleasant surprise of some people in the room, but it doesn't surprise me. You know, some of our biggest school choice actors or in the audience today, mm -hmm. right? Because uh, access to high quality educational choices mm -hmm. for every children mm -hmm. is something that is vitally necessary and connected to this mm -hmm. as well. Um, so this, I mean, this is, when I think about what we have done in the first term and what we are looking to do in the second term, uh, this is as high as anything else. Mm -hmm. it, it is that topic we have done something on each of the first four years and I have no doubt that we will tackle each of the next four years, um, whether that is budgetary investments, policy reforms, whether those are administration bills or bills we support brought by other stakeholders, or you know, if you talked about Senator Hale and Representative Littleton and Representative Leatherwood and Senator Rose and the other legislators that are in the room, they're leading on this, right? Mm -hmm. Our legislative team and our policy team gets together with them and we compare notes of whiteboards and spreadsheets <laughs> and walls filled with post-it notes of innovative ideas in other places. And and what's amazing is, you know, we usually there's a post-it note on Senator Hale's wall and in our policy office's <laughs> wall, right? And it matches up. And so there's a lot of alignment, uh, which is yet one of many reasons I have a lot of faith that we're going to be able to move the needle in some significant ways. We might be responsible for this term. But, we might be responsible. Yeah, maybe you're the common denominator. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's to say thank you to both of you for letting no. us be a part of that conversation. Um, what, what do you see in a very limited time, what do you see as the lowest hanging fruit? Maybe not, maybe not the thing that will uh, make the biggest difference, but the easiest thing to get done. Hmm, that's interesting. I mean, look, we're going to make significant investments. We're going to push big policy reforms. We were always going to do that. Uh, the pandemic exacerbated and highlighted a lot of these issues. Um, the Dobbs decision uh, from the Supreme Court and um, has kind of been a catalyst for everyone across the ideological spectrum, across um, partisan aisles, uh, to say, yeah, now is the time. Now is the need, and now is the time. And let's, you know, let's use that opportunity uh, to significantly move the needle. Uh, Lance Billio is here. Uh, he is the new executive director of the governor's office of faith-based and community initiatives. I think my answer, <laughs> I wouldn't be a good staff member for Governor Lee if, if I didn't use that as an opportunity to once again reiterate. I think the lowest hanging fruit actually has nothing to do with a legal change mm -hmm. or budgetary investments, although those are important and we'll see those. I think the lowest hanging fruit is working better by connecting the nonprofits, our houses of worship, the public sector, and the private sector together. You know, you know, organizations like Tennessee Kids Belong, DCS. A lot of this work has already been happening, uh, but I really do think we find ourselves at a tipping point to where we can get so much more done. There are you know, some of the largest churches in our state are partnering with nonprofits that want to spend tens of millions of dollars mm -hmm. to do big things right. in order to make sure that spend 
and those resources are where they can most effectively be used requires collaboration with the legislature and the governor's office and the Department of Children's Services and all of these. Like everyone has a special and unique role to play. We need to make sure we are empowering them to do it and breaking down barriers and silos so everybody is talking so that we're all moving in the same direction. A collaborative interest. Yeah. 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 That's right. I'm always, I'm always. So that was, you answered my very last question. So I'm, I'm going to skip that one uh, and move up to ask the inverse of the question I asked, which is uh, to say, what keeps you up at night? I almost said that earlier, and I think I've said it to you before, in addition to probably a couple dozen people in this room, <laughs> that the thing, there are a lot of things when you're the governor's chief of staff that, you know, I have three boys, uh, eight, five, and three. Um, and so they keep me up at night. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. but but when you know when when my when one of them calls out to me at you know one a.m. or three a.m. or at some point in time, what what require you know what forces me to have those wheels spinning so I can't go back to sleep is the question, and undoubtedly that question is this issue of foster care and adoption and vulnerable children and families. That's what keeps me up at night, is I know, you know, now is kind of the prescient time of election days next Tuesday, everybody do your civic duty, get out to the polls and vote. Um, you know, election days next Tuesday, and uh, God willing, we'll be able to serve a second term. And, now is the time it feels like the clock is ticking down behind me and behind us. Of we've only got a little over four years left. This is the issue I want to make sure that when Governor Lee leaves office, we're not saying, gosh, yeah, wish we could have done more. Yeah. Um, and you know you will on a lot of issues. You know it's inevitable. You, you know that better than anybody. But this is the issue I want to make sure we do everything we can to be able to say more children and families across the state have a safe place to be um, and have a place of belonging and purpose. Um, and I know we can do it. I'm 100% encouraged that we can do it. Uh, I know it will be challenging though. And you've got to be clear eyed about how difficult it is in order to actually be successful. And I, and I, think, I think we are doing that because of the people in this room. Yeah. So. Well, any closing thoughts on the Governor Lee uh, issued his uh, adoption month proclamation mm -hmm. for November? So yeah. Grateful for that. I, I think my closing thought is that, you know, the people in this room collectively have the experience and the networks and the connections. Uh, you've been you've been and you are in the trenches. You have the horror stories, you know the foster kids from traumatic backgrounds and the challenges they face. You know the families that enter into that trauma uh, and have secondhand trauma because of it. Uh, you know the organizations that are doing the work. Um, you know the donors who are looking to give to something that can move the needle. You're the legislators who have the pay to lead on this issue. Um, don't leave anything unsaid. Like, I know a lot of you are probably like, do they really want to hear what I've seen? Do they really want to know the hard truth? The answer is yes, because we're not going to solve it if we don't hear from you. So reach out to me, reach out to Commissioner Flynn, reach out to Lance, reach out to your legislators in the room, reach out to each other. Um, I know we can do this. Governor Lee, Commissioner Flynn, the nonprofit leaders, the legislators, we're committed to making it happen. Um, but we can't do it if, you know, you're, you may be understand it, understandably jaded and cynical, but you've got to push through that um, and engage and lean in with us and together on this. And and we can make Tennessee the most adoption from the state in the country. I have no doubt about that. Uh, but it's going to take each and every single one of you. So thanks for everything you do, and I look forward to us doing it together. So. Thanks, sir. <laughs>
Well, thanks, Joseph, for joining us. That was that was great. I know there are people here who are not afraid to say everything that's on their mind, so <laughs> uh, I really appreciate that. Our next uh, guest is the is Margie Quinn, who is the commissioner of the Department of Children's Services. She was appointed just this past September uh, by Governor Lee to lead the agency just two months ago. Prior to that, Commissioner Quinn uh, led the nonprofit in slavery, Tennessee. She has many years of experience in law enforcement and the Tennessee Bureau of, of Investigation and is an adopted parent herself. So, Mr. Quinn. Thank you. Good morning. It's great to be with you. Um, I would echo everything that Joseph said. Um, I have been in and out of state government, uh, was quietly residing in a little nonprofit, uh, <laughs> like my retirement, and the governor called and said, hey, will you take over DCS? And I felt like I've been hit by a hammer. Um, and after talking with my family about it, um, I said, yes, um, I'll take it. Um, and after, after about eight, eight weeks now, uh, drinking from a fire hose, I can tell you I've made it longer than the, uh, than the British Prime Minister. And, <laughs> Yeah. We're building kind of a cabbage, um, and, and we're in it to win it at this point. Um, I too believe in public-private partnerships, and uh, did that all across the state for about 10 years, really moving the needle on human trafficking in the state. And, and I believe strongly in that model. And so I'm looking out across uh, a lot of nonprofit leaders in this state, um, and I also am a firm believer in telling it like it is. And if you watch my testimony to the ad hoc committee, you will know that I'm going to tell it like it is. I'm going to be very candid, and I'm going to I'm not playing hide the ball. Um, we're going to speak very candidly and transparently about the challenges that we face. Um, I am an adoptive parent. Um, I feel very strongly about adoption and foster care. We need permanency for the children in custody for the state of Tennessee. I met with Lance yesterday in Joseph's office and very boldly asked him in the next four years to find a thousand foster parents. We need a thousand foster parents. Um, and that's, I think that's a conservative estimate. We have over 9,000 children in state's custody and they need permanency. And they need it today. They don't need it yesterday, right? They need it today and they need it tomorrow. And that's, that's today, that's 9,000 people in custody, that's 9,000 children in custody today. So that's not including the children that are kind of going to come in tomorrow and next week and next month. So we need to be planning not for just what we have this week, but what we're going to have next month and the following month. I'm really excited um, to learn and grow with the legislature on policy for what we're going to be able to do to make Tennessee the most adoption and foster friendly state in the nation. I've been uh, talking with Senator Hale. I'm excited about his plans and the administration's plans to make Tennessee the most adoption friendly state in the nation. I am an adoptive parent. We went overseas for adoption because frankly domestic adoption 15, 16 years ago was not very adoption friendly. And so for me personally, we chose international adoption. We would have chose domestic adoption if the adoption laws had been friendly for us. And so I would love to change the laws and make adoption friendly for domestic parents. It would be easy for me to sit up here and talk to you about policy and numbers because I do that really well. And again, if you watch my ad hoc committee testimony, you know that I love to talk numbers I love to talk policy and analytics. That's, that's where I shine. Um, but I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a story, and that's um, about my 16-year-old. She would cringe and crawl out of the room about this story. Because she is internationally adopted, it felt very comfortable for her to be able to find her birth mother. And she wanted to be able to find her, uh, her birth mother. So she did Ancestry DNA because she wanted to know a little bit about her background. And so she is from Guatemala. So we got her Ancestry results. She was thrilled to learn a little bit about herself. But through her Ancestry results, she connected with a distant cousin. 
We also knew through her adoption paperwork that she had a, a half-brother. Through that ancestry result, we were able to connect with that half-brother on Facebook. And through that, we found her, her birth mother. She now talks with her birth mother on WhatsApp pretty regularly. And actually, it's inspired her to learn Spanish, which is great. <laughs> she should be able to speak Spanish. She was never interested in speaking Spanish. And I said, you're going to want to speak Spanish. Someday you're going to be standing in front of your birth mother, and you're not going to be able to communicate with her. Who was right? Mom was right. <laughs> <laughs> right? So she is now National Honor Society in Spanish in two years wow. because she wants to be able to speak to her birth mother mm -hmm. in Spanish. For her eighth grade graduation, she went to St. Anne's in her eighth grade graduation dress. We went shopping and we took pictures of every dress she tried on and we texted them to her birth mother in Guatemala so that she felt like she was there with us shopping for her eighth grade graduation dress. And it was a beautiful experience for her. And so I just share that with you because it's a beautiful story about what happens for adoption. It's, it's not easy for me to share that type of story with you. It'd be much easier for me to share a numbers story with you. But I share that with you so that you know that I feel very strongly about adoption. We need to find permanency for children through adoption and foster care. Thank you for letting me come and speak with you. I hope to work with all of you for public-private partnerships so that we make Tennessee the most adoption-friendly state in the nation. Thank you. Our next uh, conversation is going to be with Senator Farrell Hale. Senator Hale is the Speaker Pro Tem of the Tennessee State Senate. He uh, has represented, represented Sumner County since 2010. And in your personal life, you are a farmer, a businessman, a pharmacist, and an adopted parent. So thank you, Senator Hale, for joining us, and we'll jump right in if that's okay. So, good morning. Good morning. Senator Hill, you have been a great champion for children and families. You were the sponsor of the Safe Baby Corps legislation when it first introduced in Tennessee. Why is this issue so important to you, and why is it so important for Tennessee? In case you don't know, uh, these questions are prepped ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> And I really haven't gotten a good answer for that question yet. Uh, and I thought about that quite a bit. Uh, I think part of it goes back to, I'm an only child, for one thing. And my dad and mom, but my dad uh, more particularly, uh, became involved with uh, Children's Home in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Okay. And were uh, taking clothes and food and money up to there and go visit. And Dad came back one day from up there, not probably 10 years old, I don't know, and he talked about a little girl up there that uh, he had seen, and he said, what would you think about us bringing her home? And I was all for that. I said, sure, I'd, I'd be, I think that'd be a great thing to do. They, my parents didn't do that, but I think that initiated within me the idea of providing homes for children that needed a permanent home. And so that, that's part of it, and certainly the adoption process that we've gone through. And one other thing is that in my work as a pharmacist, I, I just saw way too much abuse of children, what I considered abuse and lack of care of children uh, in my practice. And so all that together kind of generated uh, this process, and then I went to a seminar shortly after being elected to the General Assembly that discussed ACEs, and then uh, Zero to Three at another conference and kind of put that together, and it's just become kind of a passion. So what, as, as a member of the General Assembly, what is the General Assembly's role in addressing those issues? 
Well, I think we have to, I, I really go back to the governor's comment that government can't solve these problems. Uh, but we can certainly put some guardrails up that need to be done. There, there's some, uh, and some directives, some pathways, uh, some policy, uh, all that needs to come in play. What we don't need to do is have so much red tape that it'd be so convoluted and so time consuming that we don't that we don't reach the goal that we're looking for. And the goal we're looking for is to get children to a permanent stable home as quick as possible as possible. If we drag that out for years, make that uh, go on and on and on, that's that's a problem. And so uh, the government needs not to do that. We need to make it a smooth process. So you're deeply engaged in these discussions. You've been gracious enough to let us participate. We thank you for that. Uh, are there, I know you've talked to a lot of stakeholders. Are there? A lot. A lot. Are there, I've seen, I've seen the post-it the post note all. Um, are there three or five big issues that you hear the most? Um, I think so. I want to Paul was just me, Chip McConkey standing on the back wall back there, and he, he's the author of all the post-it notes that you hear about. <laughs> I'm he's sorry. He's done a great job on that, so I want, to, I want to shout out to him about that. So, three or four big things. Um, when I think of the issues that we're dealing with, the number one issue that I see as a problem is the time. How long it takes to get children to a permanent home. We had a conversation yesterday with um, some the governor's staff, and in that conversation rolled out this idea of the difference between neglect and abuse. And thus far, we as government have identified and treated those as the same. When you stop and think about that, they are not the same thing. So here, after months of discussion and conversation, this kind of rolls out. Why are we addressing these two issues the same with parents that are neglecting children or parents that are abusing children? And when you think about rehabilitating those parents, those biological parents, that's two different pathways that we need to be looking at, rather than one pathway that where we try to do it all in one swoop. And that's a fallacy of government. Government tends to want to take a big picture and this is the way it should be for every child, every family, all across the state. And that's not really reality. And so how do you delve into those type things? Which brings up the other point that I say that, that's a real issue is the time that it takes. It, it just, there's just too much red tape and too much time uh, that's required. Uh, I could probably go on several meetings, but I'll stop. Th those are good. Uh, I like those, and I like the way that you've um, outlined that difference between abuse and neglect. I'm glad, I'm glad we're thinking about that. What, I'll ask what I asked Joseph, are there anything that you see as the lowest hanging fruit, maybe not the things that make the biggest difference, but the easiest things to get done? I thought his uh, response was very insightful, and, and I like that. I, had, I was not thinking along that line. Uh, I was thinking about what's simple, what can be done. Uh, obviously, uh, caseworkers are an issue uh, concerning pay and salary, and also for the nonprofits. Uh, that's an issue. When you've got a, a caseworker that's carrying 25, 35 cases, they can't do that. And so when you're losing more than you're gaining uh, every week, uh, you've got to make some changes. And so uh, I'm, I'm real hesitant to, to just throw money at an issue, and I hope you don't hear that being said, because I don't think you can just throw money at an issue without underlining thoughts and processes and uh, policy that goes with that. But I certainly think that the General Assembly needs to step up, and we did last year. We increased some some salaries, and we're going to have to do that again. We've got to get this where that you're not sacrificing your personal life to serve children. One of the things that I think about that uh, 
Preachers are tough. Ministers are tough. Is don't forsake your family or your church family. It's easy to do. It's easy to do in this with caseworkers and the work that you do. You get, you're so passionate about it that many sacrifices are made that you shouldn't be making. It's not healthy for you. It's not healthy for your family. And to be honest, it's probably not healthy for the work you're trying to do. I think that can be true for foster families as well. Absolutely. Uh, uh, my granddad was a pastor, so I, <laughs> that resonates very strongly with me. Um, and that kind of answered that next question, of, but I'll ask it specifically. Is there anything that keeps you up at night? Any one thing that just weighs on you as you're thinking about what we need to do? I don't know. I wake up at one at two o'clock most mornings. <laughs> uh, anyway, and uh, for whatever reason, uh, along this line, the thing that bothers me the most is the time frame. How that going back to the ACEs discussion, uh, eighty percent of the brain development takes place from zero to five years old, and we languish a child in and out of foster care in different homes, and this this chronic. Um, adverse situation with children for three to four years out of that five years life and, and we're expecting different results in third grade yeah. <laughs> you know that that's the terminology that's what really disturbs me keeps me up at night about this we've got to change that I know that we're a very strong mental rights state, and, and I'm for that. Uh, I, I think that that, but going back to the abuse and neglect, you can help one, you might not be able to help the other. Let's move quickly. Let's make determinations, and let's move quickly in how we go about getting children to a permanent home. And one of you, I've forgotten who, maybe, I don't, I'm not sure, I'll start. I call my Chandler told me this, and, and I bought into this, is that if you start the TPR, the, the removing the child from the home, the parental rights, if you start in six months, or if you start in three years, you've got a certain set of individuals that will not move till that starts. Mm -hmm. And if it starts at three months, they're going to move, and you'll be able to determine whether they're going to be able to work and, and keep their children or whether they're not. And if you wait for three years, you've got that same parent doing the very same thing. So why are we taking two and a half extra years to get to that point? There's, there's a, a difference between starting the process and the process being fired. It's kind of taken me a little bit of a while to figure this out, but there is, when you start the process, the clock's ticking, and we're going to follow this timeline. And so the parent still has an opportunity to get their act together, but we've got a deadline, and then we're going to move. Is there and that's a, that's a hard push. There's going to be push against yes. that. Yes. There's going to be push against that, and I understand that. And there needs to be somebody on the other side that's pushing against me. Mm -hmm. That's saying, well, what about this? What about, you know, but I'm willing to have that discussion, that debate. I think I'll end with this then. There's clearly, clearly support in the room for what you just said. <laughs> how, how, how can we help? What can we do to help? Keep, keep working. Just keep working. You need to to reach out to the members of the General Assembly, uh, to the governor's staff. Uh, there's just to DCS. Um, they they are aware. You, you've heard from DCS already. You've heard from the governor's office already. Governor's assured me. We I've had a conversation with him and with his staff a couple of times, and and he assured me that he wanted to push. And there was a uh, I'll be honest, don't remember the item, particular item we were talking about came up 
And I, I said, I really want to push on this item. And he said, well, okay, I do remember. I've got it written down here. Hold on. Um, I'm not very smart, so I have to make notes. Due process. You know, that's a really important concept that parents need due process. But under what time frame? Can you not have due process within a certain time frame? I think you can. Our legal friends are going to push back against that. And the argument is we don't want adoptions overturned. I got that. I don't want the, any of that either. But I think we can push against that due process timeline. Not against due process, but the timeline of how that works. And we're going to have, you know, some of the conversation that, that I'm having and that I'm rolling over to my head is, why does it take so long for these court cases to take place? I heard yesterday, the day before, where that there was a TBR filing, it was a year before it was heard. We've got to change that. Judges are gonna push back against that, that if you say, judge, you've got to hear this within 60 days, or within 30 days, you know, they're gonna push back, and there's reason for them to push back. But I want to push against that. Senator, you, uh, in, our, in our very first meeting, you told me stay focused and stay aggressive. And I have tried to remember that uh, since that day. Thank you so much uh, for coming this morning and for speaking. Welcome to you. Uh, one one quick housekeeping note, we put some note cards and pencils at your chair. The purpose of that is uh, if anybody thinks of a question during the panel that they want to pass up, just pass it to the end of the row. Uh, Jennifer and Ann Waller, I think, are going to try to collect those, or Michelle, and then uh, if uh, they're going to pass them up as we can. I can't promise we'll get to any, but I'm going to do my best to get that done in the next 35 minutes. So with that, if I could make just a quick introduction uh, for everybody. Uh, on the end, Laura Troop is Agape's Director of Donor Relations. She is also a former foster parent, though this is the private adoption panel. She is a former foster parent. Um, Emily Richards has a long history of service with Show Hope, a globally recognized voice in adoption and orphan care that was founded by her parents, Mary Beth and Stephen Curtis Chapman. She is also a member of our policy committee and serves on the advisory council for the Congressional Coalition on Adoption Institute, which is the largest bipartisan Congress in Congress, I learned uh, a few months ago. And Lauren Webb is an adoptive parent and the director of legislation for the Tennessee Comptroller. She also serves on our policy committee, and uh, our comptroller is also an adoptive parent. I think you would be okay with me saying that's pretty public. About it. So, uh, as we begin, what I thought I would do is quickly outline the um, the goals that we set for private adoption. As you'll see on your screen, I'm going to look this one up here. So, first is to improve the timing and process related to voluntary surrender. Again, this is private and agency adoption that we're talking about right now, not foster care. Uh, achieve permanency faster and more efficiency, efficiently, reduce the cost of adoption, <clears throat> expand support for birth mothers, or we could say birth parents, considering uh, their options, and expand access to documents and records. So those are the five overarching goals that we kind of established. So with that, uh, I think where I want to start is, on average, a private or agency adoption costs twenty-five or fifty thousand uh, dollars, and it takes multiple years. As we've talked to more people, the three questions that I hear most often are: Why does it cost so much? Why does it take so long? And why did so many people that I know either adopt from another state or a child that was born in another country? So we'll use those to just kind of set the stage. I'm going to throw you guys in. Why does it cost so much? What are the factors that drive up that cost? And what's happening in those situations that we hear about when adoption costs seventy-five or hundred thousand dollars? Way, way more than that. And if anybody can start. I won't. I won't pick. I'll hop in first. Okay. Uh, 
it's an honor to be here. Thank you for having thank me. You. And thank you all for making time on busy schedules to be here. Um, so it's, it, it's interesting, Show was founded in 2003, so over just the um, 20 years time we've been in the work in reviewing adoption aid applications for families that are adopting their private domestic or intercountry adoption, we've seen a steady in, increase um, in both domestic and intercountry adoption expenses. I think some of the necessary requirements of that go into that expense is part of it's educating the general public, right? There's um, professional fees, there's certain safeguard procedures that need to happen. Um, all of that involves professional um, expertise that feeds into that that needs to be compensated <laughs> fairly and adequately to ensure that um, uh, adoption is being done ethically in the best interest of the child. So I think that's part of it. Um, I also would say, you know, we've seen a 90% decrease in intercountry adoption since the height of intercountry adoption in 2004. We had 23,000 children that came home to the United States through intercountry adoption. That was 1,700 children last year, um, and that decline was happening well before the pandemic. And so I think you also have seen a bottleneck on some of um, the agencies, which I'd be interested to hear from you from a perspective. But um, some of the some of the agencies where maybe fee structures were spread across in the country and domestic and able to um, share, there's been more uh, pressure along with regulatory um, demands from the local. So that's my answer. I'll add to that, um, you know, the, the fees are, I would attribute the, the average fee as being heavily influenced by brokerage. Mm -hmm. um, there are, there are um, law firms and, and broker brokers that look for children, for people who are looking for children. Um, on, on our private agency side, our max is 24. We have a sliding fee scale and, and that is you know, capped at 15% of your gross income. So um, we try to be we try to be fair. Um, you know we have to pay our people um, appropriately to do the work, um, but there are fees that are that are just wrapped up in, in that majority probably with related to related to the legal aspect of it. Um, but we try to be fair with that. We do, have never done international adoptions, but they have been on the steady decline just because of um, the uh, aggressive nature at which. And, and the resources with the, that the United States has to go to other countries and rescue children or or um, come in with kind of savior mentality. Um, however, children need permanency. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, most people go into it with sincere hearts and we're, you know, we're gonna, we feel called to this. The Lord has called us to adopt as he adopted us into his family. So yeah. um, the intersection of, of faith and government comes into play all across the board, um, but we just have to be sensitive to that and educate adoptive parents to understand what the process should be and what to expect along the way. And what questions to be asked. And, and what questions to be asking 100%. Um, I'm just going to speak as an adoptive parent. Um, so we did adopt, my husband and I adopted our child. He is now 20 months old. And so we did adopt him at birth. Uh, but we did go through an agency out of Georgia, mainly because of the cost and also because of the time. You know, you could, um, it was just a lot quicker time to actually get your child and get, and get your child back home uh, than what the process is here in Tennessee. Um, but as far as the cost, I do think one of the reasons why we went with our agency, because I do think their, their prices were very fair. Um, and a lot of their costs, they would actually give us a quarterly breakdown of the percentage that would go towards admin versus the percentage that goes towards services for the birth parents. Um, and of course, their admin costs, they kept as low as they possibly could. And we really respected that and, and liked that about the agency. And then they also provided a lot of services for the birth parents as far as uh, any kind of medical services, including mental health counseling, as well as even job training if the birth parents chose that route. Um, and so I do think as you see the rising cost going up across the country, then you do have this rising cost in, um, in, in these services as well. And so that's going to increase the amount that you're having to pay uh, for private adoption. Uh, we, uh, I think we addressed all three of those points, but I do want to throw one thing in there before we move on because I think we may get to that later. Um, those adoptions that cost so much more than average, what's the, what's the factor there? Is, is there a primary factor? 
on those adoption of cost Yeah. You alluded to um, facilitator baby, baby brokers um, that we've seen, you know, you've seen a rise in the onto the scene of the adoption conversation have come um, entities that uh, find a way in which the, the timeliness of the adoption um, and the age of the child that's being welcomed home is of value to the adoptive family and they prey on that and um, elevate fees uh, and introduce um, very high fee structures to move a, move a child into a family quicker. That's kind of how they advertise. So I think that's driven up. That's one um, factor that's driven up. And so I think a lot, again, you alluded to just the importance of educating the public, mm -hmm. the general public on what questions to ask, asking for fee structures, making sure they're aware of uh, what agency they're working with. Um, I think it's interesting since the DOS decision this summer, um, and this is just an anecdotal remark based on the work that I get to see at Show Hope, um, we review adoption aid applications for families that are adopting domestically in our country through a wide variety of agencies as long as they're a licensed nonprofit agency. And so we saw 12 new agencies that we have never heard of pop on to the scene in this last review period wow. that had not been here since the DOS decision dropped. So um, it would be unwise to think that there are not actors that are also finding space in this new landscape to prey on um, vulnerabilities. I'm going to say what you said, what I think you said a little more crassly. There are there are entities out there who prey on the vulnerability of prospective adoptive families and the vulnerability of parents who are looking to make an adoption plan because for whatever reason they don't believe they're really a parent or, or able to parent at the time. And people Connect those two things and charge. And there's a vulnerable population and a monetized response. Yeah, that actors will, will, pre will present. So, so we ban. I'm going to jump ahead. That did you. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, I'm going to jump ahead for just a moment and jump back. But we we currently ban in Tennessee facilitators and brokers, which is kind of what we call that population of people. Many states do. I think mo most states do. Not all. It, it it gets to be a little difficult to enforce, particularly when you have actors who coming coming in from out of state, advertising online, that kind of thing. Is there anything that we could do at the state level or, or at the federal level to put some teeth behind uh, what we already banned to to better remove those bad actors from the field? So there's only so much that, that, in my opinion, you can do because there, until all states respect those same boundaries, mm -hmm. um, individuals are going to look where it's going to be easiest for them to adopt. Um, and so they're going to look at the states where it is easiest to adopt. So that's, mm -hmm. that's where they're called. And so if we can make it easier to adopt in Tennessee um, and you know, remove some other barriers, then we have a huge opportunity um, to make, make a difference here in our state and have our children in our state adopted without birth mothers leaving the state to have their babies because they're being compensated to have their babies, mm -hmm. etc. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say a couple of ideas that um, have been thrown around is um, maybe a private cause of action mm -hmm. uh, for. Uh, the adoptive parents, if it's something like that does happen to them, maybe we can beef up the statutes to where they do have uh, an easier path in the court system to bring this case before the courts. Uh, that could be an idea. Uh, maybe even, and I'm kind of speaking out of my realm of knowledge here, but maybe even some kind of a registration requirement uh, with the state government so that way there is a little bit of oversight um, over this process and even you know as an adoptive parent I did find uh, in doing some research and figuring out what agency we were going to go through and, and how this process actually works uh, I personally found um, it was kind of difficult to navigate the process and it was difficult to find uh, what all agencies do offer adoption um, services and can help us uh, get through this process because like you said you know as adoptive parents a lot of times we are called and it's a calling from god and for my husband and i that was exactly what we felt was this very big calling and um and so it is heartbreaking to think that you know 
if we had not have found the agency that we did, that we could have gone with one of these brokers or facilitators that could have taken advantage of us. Um, it really does not have the best interest of the child at heart, and even and even the birth parents at mm -hmm. heart. You know, there is kind of a system where they're using these folks, and, and that's uh, pretty heartbreaking. So maybe even like a registration type thing where, you know, prospective birth, uh, uh, adoptive parents could actually go to the state and see here are these agencies, or here are these um, adoption agencies that are, you know, Qualified, they're they're up to par. They're not going to try to just take your money and take advantage of this very uh, sensitive situation. Just as a, a quick anecdotal remark, in in the interim, while that's getting established, that would be fabulous. Um, if you have people in your community or those that are interested in um, considering private domestic intercountry adoption, Show Hope does have a resource, howtoadopt.org. And we have done a deep dive even recently in um, curating and uh, editing that content to really try to be an educational resources. What questions should you be asking an agency? What fees should you see on a fee schedule or not see? Um, and so trying to address some of that is a helpful tool. This is one of those issues that falls in the ethical bucket. In my, mentally, it falls in the ethical scary. bucket for me. So uh, it's, it's pretty important in our, in our, our personal conversation as well. Um, Jeremy, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, but you said, is there anything that we can do at the state level? But the statute is already there. The problem that we have in the private adoption is that nobody is nobody is enforcing the, the facilitation. And so having somebody in charge of that yeah. just would be great. The, and I'm sorry to interrupt. No, you're okay. Like, there are, the, there is some. The, the, yeah, it, we already ran it. The, the, I think the point that we were making was um, it's difficult to enforce because of the way the statute is written. And because of the fact that people are out of state, and so there are potential some, potentially some policy things that we can put in place to make that more enforceable. Uh, so quickly, before we kind of move on uh, to more broadly into that topic, I do want to just hit on international adoption for just a moment. I know that it is driven primarily by federal, international, other countries' laws and international treaty, but. Is there anything that we can do at the state level that would just make that experience just a little bit better? Anything we can do at all? Yes. <laughs> it's also driven by bilateral relations, which I think we could encourage a uh, continued increase in um, enhancing bilateral relations at the federal level with other countries. Uh, I do think one thing that we've talked about in conversation is recognition within the state of Tennessee when children do come home through intercountry adoption, there's been a lot of movement, um, very positively so, where uh, citizenship is retroactive to birth from the federal level, but to have access to a Tennessee record of birth would be really, um, I think, meaningful for what I kind of talk about, relics of childhood, these important mementos for our children that have experienced early relational trauma. I think that that would be meaningful. And then just an awareness in, in common conversation Adult Adoptee Citizenship Act is something that's um, up and being talked about at the federal level. It's something that we need to continue to have on our radar for those um, of our American uh, fellow American citizens that came home before 2000 on a different visa. Um, their citizenship wasn't automatic, and some parents that that perhaps didn't understand there was additional paperwork to file. Um, they go to get their passport and face deportation, and that's not okay. Um, and so just having that on our radar and a conversation or fundability of the adoption tax credit at the federal level is something else that comes into mind. So, when we're talking about domestic infant adoption particularly, how important are those first few days, hours, weeks after that child is born for bonding with, with <laughs> <laughs> nobody wants this one, for bonding with that adoptive family, we know that that child is suffering a tremendous amount of loss. And we're going to talk about trauma uh, a little bit later in this conversation. Uh, but how critical is that early bonding time for connection? And is there anything in our current law that kind of hinders that? Well, I think there are maybe a few timing issues that are going to cause concern. Mainly, it's going to cause concern for the family accepting the child into their home. They're going to say, if this is not certain, I don't want to put myself through this heartbreak of having a child and then it not go through, or a birth father show up. or mm -hmm. So, you know, jumping through all those hoops are really key. Um, I love the idea of 
um, some sort of documentation that a mother has before having her child so that nothing else can come into play and swoop in and say, okay, this isn't happening, even though that was mother's intention, something happens to her. Yeah, or, or, or if she she disappears, she you know, she surrenders at the hospital and then it's hard to find her again. Um, there's There are challenges in communication, uh, but those bonding opportunities at the very beginning, those neural pathways being formed at the very outset of life, um, and we're learning more and more about that, and it is key for families who are adopting, um, for women who are placing, to understand what key development is happening in that child. Because even if that child never lays eyes on that, that birth parent when they're born and placed immediately into the arms of the adoptive parent, there's still trauma. Mm -hmm. There's still um, connection lost, which impacts their brain development, which impacts their further behaviors and development along the way. And until we, we improve connection, which thank heavens that in 2020, DCS updated its foster parent curriculum to be more trauma informed. Uh, this trust based relational intervention that, that is done through Show Hope and, and um, their organization, super helpful for people understanding. I always say, I, I love trauma. I don't love trauma. I love knowing about trauma because it helps me to be a better mom. It helps me to be a better trainer to help families who are taking children in from difficult places to know what's happening in their bodies and their brains because of what they've been through. Even if, um, if nothing happens to them after they've been born, they've had nine months of something happening to them. Even if it was wonderful, even if it was healthy, they've lost that connection. So I know you have something. Because yeah, you guys train this all the time. So. Strong answer. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's okay. I, th I, I think the point that you were making is that we, we have a timeline right now. Every state is different. And there are delays in our current timeline that could be addressed, perhaps, to get those children more permanently secured in, in the adoptive family. And there's a replication period that 10 years ago was... Uh, <coughs> 30 days? It, it was, ten. well, ten. less than 10 years ago, it was 10 days. Yeah. Yes. Right. And so, you know, we that it's it's much better. And I think it's probably at a good spot. Um, it could seem to be a little faster, but not too fast. Yeah. Because we have, we, it, it, you know, there are certain time frames that seem too fast because like it's a know. big decision. <laughs> yeah. It's a big decision that this parent has made for the future of their child. Yeah. And so, you know, there needs to be some, uh, hold on. Let's push pause for just a second. Yes, this is the decision I want to make. Here we go. And for, for those of you who don't, I think most of you do know this, but the the, the process here is uh, when a child is born, you, you wait 72 hours before the child can be surrendered. The child is surrendered in court, and then there's another 72 hours in business days that um, would then extend until, that, that's the revocation period where a person can change their mind. And the child is surrendered in court if you can get a court. If you, yeah, if you, that was and kind of my next question. They're delays the in court in the city. The court, yeah. court is the biggest hold up in the whole process. Are they, and that was alluded to earlier. Right? Are Seriously. they worse at certain places? Is it worse at certain places? Yeah. I won't ask you where. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, think about those most heavily de densely populated counties um, where you're limited to that county because it's your county of residence or where the child was born. Okay. Those are going to be the most difficult to get into. Um, so there are potentially some options where we can adjust um, the court process, making it easier to get an appointment. Mm -hmm. Your um, so so once we're past that period, a child is placed with a family. Right, one of the things I personally think we do really well is that guardianship gets granted when the child is born, which is really really good. Lots of don't do that, um, but. Once you have that child in, in your home, the child currently, under state law, is in your home for six months before that adoption gets finalized. Is another variety of things going on in that six months. Is that the right timeline? Can we do that faster? Can we get that child to a permanent place, a fully permanent place? I'm going to speak to this. I've dominated this conversation. That's OK. I was just going to say, um, for our adoption, so in, in, whenever we were in Georgia, we were placed, um, our son was born March the 2nd um, of 2021, um, but then we were not picked until two days later. And then we had to go through the ICPC process, so we spent a total of 
10 days, maybe 11 days in Georgia before we could even come back across the state lines. Um, but from that point, whenever we did come back across state lines into Tennessee and we were at home with our son, um, we did not actually get a chance to go to court until December. So from March until December, we were not in our home study, you know, post-placement, those were all done by July. And so we were just basically hanging out <laughs> and waiting around until we could get this court case in December uh, to finalize our adoption. And so to me, that was just a very long time because you do have this just looming, you know, court case basically hanging over your head. Um, and even though I knew that we had, you know, guardianship and everything was fine, it's still this feeling as an adoptive parent, oh my goodness, they could come take my child because I don't have full legal parental rights over my child. And to me, that was so scary and so stressful. And um, even though we did everything we were supposed to, it would be a lot less stressful if we were able to um, achieve that and go to court a lot faster. Uh, but just because of the way the court case, the docket fell, uh, we could not get into the court for, you know, we did have to wait the six months and then we couldn't get in for some time after that. Uh, so I do think speeding that up would be helpful. Um, I do know of um, some friends and what have you that were not as fortunate as we were, you know, we were actually able to get our uh, adoptive son on health insurance um, but we did have to like renew our paperwork every 30 days, but not everybody has that option or that ability. And so during this time, you know, you're having to go to your child's checkups every two months or whatever the schedule might be. And a lot of parents, a lot of additional cost on top of the adoptive cost is placed because of the health care and, and the cost of uh, going to these appointments. And so I do think speeding this up and becoming having full legal rights over your child would really help alleviate at least some of that cost uh, that's on the adoptive parent. You guys knew the topics and um, we've got about five minutes left on this panel. There's some things I really want to get to. So if I skip something you want to get to, please uh, feel free to push back on me. But first, it isn't lost on me that one of the perspectives missing in this discussion right now is that of a, a parent who's made a placement, right? a mom or dad, who surren surrendered voluntarily their right to make an adoption plan for their, ch for their child. And I, I, I say this sometimes, that I, I think in society, we have this, particularly in some of our struggles, we have this view of adoption that, you know, it's, it's this young couple, maybe they're in high school or college, they made a mistake, and they're not a baby, we're not ready to be parents, we're gonna make an adoption plan, it was, this is just so beautiful. Well, like we've talked about, even in the best of circumstances, it isn't just that simple. And second, usually, uh, today, we're meeting people who are at a crisis point in their life, or probably multiple crisis points in their life, and now here's a baby, and we can solve for X. Right? We, we can solve this most immediate crisis in your life. But then they just kind of get left sometimes, right? And sometimes that's because they run, right? You, you can't force people to do things. But um, what I'm, what I think, what I'm trying to ask here is, what, what is the real need? What I, what I love about this group is that in all of the conversations we've had, I know that all of you kind of share this concern and genuine care for these birth parents, right? They, those of you who are adopted parents, as we work in the industry a real genuine concern for these birth parents and the loss that they are suffering in that moment. What is the real need there for counseling, for follow-up, for what is the real need there? Is there anything that can be affected from a public policy? Like what can state government do as opposed to what nonprofits can do? <laughs> Sorry to dominate this conversation. I, Agape really believes that mental health counseling is important. Um, we have done mental health counseling um, in this community for a long time. Um, and I think we do it really well professionally. Uh, but we also do it from a faith-based perspective. And the intersection of faith and government are right here. Um, our church has had to wrap around these women um, and men um, who make a plan, who need community. The reason often that 
that people place their children for adoption is because they don't have a community, or they have the wrong type of community, an unhealthy community um, that's not supporting them in a way that's conducive to raising a child in a safe way. Um, we also have competing um, difficulties like housing costs right now, um, the job market. Um, there are also just these, these um, food deserts, transportation challenges that happen in, in a, the population where the majority of these children um, are born into. So um, there, you can't come at it from just one direction. It has to be, it has to be approached from all directions, um, and it's not going to take just one entity or one um, legislative move to make it happen. It's going to take hitting it from every direction, um, life skills training, um, helping them to find um, educational opportunities, um, to know that they're not just um, a, a, an avenue for someone's family to grow. They are more than than what they've gone through. This this birth mom who has yes they've given they've given a child to a family who wanted the child. But they're not just that. They are, they are a worthy person who has a, a major opportunity to be a, um, a member of society that makes society better. So. I, I'm kind of like emotional looking around this room. <laughs> um, I saw the case manager that um, did our home study for my sister's adoptions. And I think that something, so my oldest sister's 23, so it was a long time ago. Um, this is a long game. It's a really long game. And that's what is so special about being a part of this community of people that care about this issue. Uh, it is not um, it is not viewing the birth parents as somebody that has something to contribute to take away leave. This is a long game. And I think Senator Hale talked about 80% um, of brain development happens from zero to five. And many of these birth families that we're working with have themselves experienced the really, really long-lasting effects of trauma and mm -hmm. adverse um, childhood experiences. And so when you think about 20 years later, they're having babies, they're just little babies themselves. And so this is work that is seeking to address that early childhood trauma that we will see in generations from, like maybe our children will be little advocates too. And then mm -hmm. they'll see all the work that the generations were standing on the shoulders of those that came before that really helped life skills, mental health counseling that started to turn the tide mm -hmm. around what we understand, um, how trauma can impact, impact the body and brain, behavior, um, belief system. So, I was just gonna say, I agree. I know um, our birth mom had a very traumatic experience. Um, she is from Guatemala, but she wanted to make sure, and I get very emotional about this, but she wanted to make sure that her son had a much better life than what she had. And that is a lot of what these birth parents want. And that's why they're willing to give up their child to another family because they love that child so much that they are willing to give it to another family that they a lot of times have never met. We were chosen by her birth mom and we had never met her. She didn't even speak any English, but she saw her life book and she felt so moved. This is really a God moment. You know, she felt so moved to pick us because she said, this family can give my son the best life. And a lot of those black parents think that. And I'm so glad that they do and that they give their child the chance of life because it is so important. And so I do think that any kind of services that we can provide these birth parents to help them better themselves, just like they are trying to better their child's life, I think would be so helpful. Maybe one day they can parent in the future, yeah. right? Because they, that hope yeah. for them, that they, that they believe they can right. in the future. Um, I, I want to expand that just a little bit uh, on the trauma part before we we're super close on time here, but um, every part of the constellation feels the trauma, right? The, these birth parents that we're talking about, I mean, for them, that's the equivalent of um, your child being born dying, that, that detachment. And um, if you're a, an adopted parent and have a replacement fall through once you've taken place well, that, that's the I can take experience on that like that is the same thing and, and it's true for the the grandparents the aunts and uncles and the cousins and the siblings and, and on both sides of that equation uh, and certainly for the child right there losing that first closest connection they have and sometimes the only voice they've ever known 
uh, in that level. So I guess the, the question there is, are, are, are adoptive families adequately prepared <laughs> for what's happening here, uh, particularly with the child? Are hospitals prepared uh, in understanding the situation that they're dealing with? Uh, and then when, when we leave here today, <laughs> like what do we want people to walk away knowing about uh, trauma and, and the trauma that occurs within the adoption constellation? And maybe they didn't know when they walked in the room this morning. Uh, how, how, how much weight are believed on them? That was like a three-part question that will take the next 30 minutes to answer. Yeah, so that right. um, I do think, I'll just decline to the last part of that, when Laura re uh, just referenced trust-based relational intervention, which is the California um, clear, Clearinghouse of Evidence-Based um, Child Welfare Interventions is highly effective. It's been interwoven all through the PATH training, but um, there are organizations like Show Hope, uh, Safe and Secure Tennessee, it's bringing trauma informed care for all Tennesseans everywhere in Tennessee. There are rotating trainings now available online, a new one will start in, in January. Very accessible webinar format. Uh, Rania Faulkner at DCS has been a champion of bringing trauma informed care into the department. And so my answer would be I want everyone to walk out hopeful that we have the resources in this state to help meet this need. Um, I add that during the pandemic, Tennessee was one of nine states that saw an increase in adoptions. Only nine. So, um, you know, we're, we're making strides, right? Um, but I think it's important that we, that we remember that adoption is not the pretty bow on the package. Mm -hmm. everything, isn't, everything isn't perfect and, and great and good, good luck. You did it, hooray! Um, but you have, to, you have to wrap around those families too because there will be challenges. They may not come later, okay, until later. They'll come at some point. You are going to experience challenges. I don't want those kids who've been adopted to end up in foster care because their parents weren't capable. We have got to have continual education, um, educating families before they adopt, but then agencies coming around, government coming around, and providing care and training for these families moving forward so that they can be successful in parenting. There are parents who go through the, the pre-service foster parent training in uh, now since the curriculum has been updated to be more trauma-informed that say, man, I wish I had this training before I had a biological children. Mm -hmm. It makes you a better parent. I'm a different parent because I was a foster parent because now you understand those pieces of trauma. And foster mm -hmm. care and adoption go hand in hand, hand in hand. And we have to come alongside all these families and wrap around with those kinds of educational pieces so that they can understand that trauma and brain development. And I think oh, one other thing, since we're in a room um, that's private, public, state leaders, when we talk about changing the narrative around caring for vulnerable children and families, it has to be a multi-systemic approach. And so we have the department has grabbed a hold of trauma-informed resources. We need the Department of Education, we need the Department of Corrections, we need the judiciary. As we begin to understand, I'm so thankful for Safe Baby Courts that, thank you for your champion center, Hale, of Safe Baby Courts, because as our judiciary understands how quick we need to move in these timelines, this all impacts and elevates the level of care for our children. And so it's exciting that there's so many leaders across different um, you know, facets of, of our state government. One, one, one question that came from the audience was about uh, trauma, but there's one piece of it I just want to double check. The services that we're talking about, mental health treatments, are those currently available for folks who are five or ten years post-adoption, or do we need to do... Is, is there a greater need there than maybe... There, there is a, a really huge need for families on down the road for mental health counseling. Um, for, for family relationships to be mended, for communication skills to be improved. And, and Agape, through the, the blessings of people who donate to us and through grants that we have as well, you know, we, we are able to provide that to families. And it's not just us, there are other people who are doing it. I think we do it really well though. Um, and so, you know, not to toot our horn, I don't do the counseling, so it's not me. I get to, I get to brag on my colleagues who are doing this work really well in, in the name of Jesus as well, so. I, I wanted to ask about openness, um, and I'm just not going to get to because of time, but I, I do want to give you all this one last question very, very quickly. Um, 
uh, that Joseph alluded to, I think Senator Hill alluded to, that, that uh, lots of people are really interested right now. There's this kind of moment in history where you've got a lot of interest around these subjects from uh, nonprofits, churches, synagogues, other communities of faith. Uh, there, so when my pastor says, hey, Jeremy, what can we do? Like, what, what do you want me to tell? What, what can I tell him? When, he, when my pastor says, Jeremy, what can we do? And you can be brutally honest about this, and you don't have to limit it to private adoption. Well, I'm opening the floor. And churches need to be talking about it in front of the pulpits. And they need to send people to agencies who are doing work. Who is, <laughs> who is fostering? Go to the foster care agencies. Go to the DCS offices. Um, it, it's important to raise awareness, but you actually have, you have to do the work. Like you got to dive in and actually provide care for these children. Um, you know, we, we, we hear great encouraging stories and motivational stories, but then there has to be a call to action. And until we're actually called to action of stepping into the space and becoming foster families or adoptive families or supporting them wrap around all of those until we're actually doing the work, not, not there's no movement. We can pat ourselves on the back and say, oh, we talked about it. That's not enough. We have to do it. Two resources that come to mind. Uh, Show Hope's Hope for the Journey Conference. It's designed for Church's House of Worship to walk through. It's a trauma-informed resource. It's broken into um, modular format, so it can be done in a day or over the course of eight weeks. So it just gives a foundational uh, talking point with your community on how to be We've also, that's one, and then um, we worked alongside Empower to Connect in Memphis to create a trauma-informed uh, competency continuum, and it's just a PDF with a resource sheet. You can find that on Shope's website under our trauma resources. Um, I agree with Laura that yes, I do think that churches do need to be uh, talking about this topic more, and actually, um, for me, I think it's helpful to find members of my church who are adoptive parents or foster parents. That way we can have a, a community and can collaborate and work together and work through different issues that we are having and know that they do have support. And even um, some women who have placed their children for adoption, uh, they also need a whole lot of care and a whole lot of services. And so I do think that churches are a good place where uh, they can bring these um, birth parents in and do and provide them some support and some care and some love because a lot of times these folks don't feel like they have a community. They don't feel like they have anybody, which is kind of what put them in certain situations in their life to begin with that led to uh, the birth of this child. And so I do think providing these sort of, these resources in this community atmosphere, both for the adoptive parents and the birth parents, really is helpful. Thank you. I really am grateful for you guys for being a part of this. We're going to switch over to foster care now. Uh, so the the same stands true for your notes in, in your note cards and pencils as before as we're switching out. Um, if it's okay, I'm just going to go ahead and quickly get started introducing everybody as we change over. Kristen Allender, social worker who's been engaged in this space of adoption and foster care for uh, more than 15 years. She's the executive director of Tennessee Kids Belong and vice president for state success for America's Kids Belong. Uh, and Kristen uh, serves on our policy committee. She is also an adoptee. Brittany Farrar is the Middle Tennessee Director of Community-Based Services and Specialized Crisis Services for Youth Villages. She started her career as a counselor, a foster care counselor, uh, and has been there. She also serves on our policy committee. And J.R. Garrett is the Chief Legal and Risk Officer and the Chief Information Security Officer for Add Your Health. J.R. is currently a foster parent in Williamson County, so he's He's living it right now today. Uh, just like last time, before we start, what I'd like to do is talk about our goals for foster care. And I'm going to look at the screen. Uh, the six goals that we set were improved stability for children in the foster care system. Senator Hill talked about a lot of these, Joseph did as well. Commissioner Clinton encouraged permanency for children in the child welfare system. Strengthen the focus on child safety and best interests. Improve the core process and recruit more good foster families. And then finally, better utilize advanced technology and data. My fault. So if we could just kind of, um, well, actually, before we do that, we're, gonna talk, we're talking about policy solutions here. Before we 
jump full foot again, I do want to say that um, what this isn't, right? This isn't a place where we come to complain about the work that DCS does, or the state does, or the case workers. Uh, we appreciate all the good work that they're doing. I know that the foster care system kind of falls under them, and sometimes they get treated, but they're doing really hard work. It's probably the most difficult job in state government. And we want to recognize that as we begin this conversation. It's not, not nothing personal about that. So of, of those six goals that we outlined, and I'll go backwards, actually, if that's helpful. Of those six goals that we outlined uh, for each of you, which one kind of stands out to us most important? Is there one that's like, man, this rises to the top? Good start. Um, well, I think they're all obviously very important, but the one that stands out to me, and maybe it's because uh, to your question as to what keeps you up at night, it's, it's the stability of children that are in foster care. And I think that when we suffer to find placement stability for youth that unfortunately are in a place where they need to be removed from their home. It impacts all of these other aspects of the system. When children move from home to home, they regress both emotionally, behaviorally, and educationally, and it also impacts their ability to uh, achieve permanency either through adoption or reunification or placement with kin. So I find that to be a front of mind, particularly because it literally keeps me up at night with phone calls, but also uh, what wakes me up and, and keeps me worried about the kids that are in our care. I'll go next. Um, it's tough to pick one, so I hate that you put us in this position, Jeremy. Um, <laughs> uh, as a lawyer, I would assume I would say the court process, which I do have to also much should change as it relates to the um, court process, um, my background, I definitely want to engage in the technology, but to recruit more of the foster families. Um, Commissioner Quinn made the comment they want to have a thousand families open. Um, well, it took me and my wife and I over four years to get open, right? So we had, um, it's one of the stories I told uh, Jeremy was we drove from the other side of uh, Franklin all the way down 96 to um, to go to Goodlandsville to go through our classes to be able to be able to foster and our home was denied being open and the paperwork was thrown away so it took again four years for us to get open so there's some the recruitment and uh, the finding good foster families I don't think it's the, the finding them is uh, necessarily the only problem but I think it's a multi pronged approach to actually not only finding them but cultivating good families and then ensuring the process is efficient for those families that are coming through. I have to agree with Brittany on this one. The one that keeps me up at night is the improving the stability. Um, the mission statement of Tennessee Kids Blog is improving experience and the outcomes for kids in care. So we focus a lot on what does their time in care look like? What did, how are we caring for the carers? How are we taking care of foster families and the social workers that, that care for those cases? So I'm going to use your answers there to kind of guide since we're in limited time some of the next questions that come. But I do want to ask one kind of, I'm going to lob a bomb here. <laughs> in the middle, if that's okay, before we move on, that is uh, to say the primary goal of the foster care system is family reunification. Now that gets dictated by the federal government. It comes down from the top. Family reunification can be really good. It's, it's, it's a good thing to aim towards. But is that the right goal, or should there be more nuance? <laughs> more nuance is part of that statement. I think part of that needs to be um, skill building around concurrent case planning. So I think a barrier that comes up is reunification with family or placement with kin should be priority, but we also need to be working multiple angles. And I think where there can be delays is if there's a singular focus and we're not planning uh, dual permanency goals throughout the process. And if we focus on multiple potential outcomes from the beginning. I think it will allow for us to expedite permanency, but also make sure that we're doing our due diligence, that we're completing diligent search to locate kin, but also focusing on another outcome, which might be through permanency of adoption. Yeah. You know, the cases that you'll hear about in the news or the, the horror stories that you see are when a child's been with a foster family or a pre-adoptive placement for a year, more than a year, and then suddenly a family member comes out of the blue and they are considered kin, right? And so I think I'm really excited about this group talking about what does it mean when a family has grown attached, when they've been in that placement for three months, six months, a year, that 
that family should be considered kin to that child, right? That's oftentimes the only family they know. Mm -hmm. So I love the idea of pushing that forward and saying, uh, who, where are the child's best interests in this? And we all say that, right? I'm a social worker by trade. That's always what we're aiming for. But sometimes policy can get in the way of a child's best interests. So how do we look at policy and say, gosh, it's common sense, some of this. This is the only family that child knows. Uh, maybe for a year or two, and how do we make sure that that child's best interest and the attachment um, and the family structure that they have known um, is prioritized in the court process? Yeah, so. Um, as it relates to reunification, uh, the goal, I would say yes, it does require more nuance, right? So the, the goal is whatever is in the best interest of the child. And I think the issue is most of the time, as you're going through, the foster care process is binary. Either this kid's going to be mine or it's not, right? And so integrating into your family and thinking through what that means, you typically want to exclude um, the kin, right? Because if you assume that what they're going to bring into the relationship with the kid is going to be detrimental to that child, right? So I think reunification can be a, a goal, but it, the primary one should be whatever the, the child's best interest, which so often the problem falls on. The, the foster parents who don't want to have that, the view of the child that, no, I'm, I'm going to be your primary caregiver, but I also want you to have that familiar tie to be able to have those people in your life that mm -hmm. I'll, I'll take on the primary burden of bringing up raising the child. Mm -hmm. I love all that. Yeah. <laughs> Good. I love all that. Um, what, so now we kind of set that <coughs> as an overarching view, what are the very quickly, like, is there one like main frustration you individually hear from your experience in the foster care system? Obviously, you can tell me it's a good thing too if you want to. But yeah, I, I'll, I'll start that. Uh, I knew I was coming this morning, so I shot out a text to several foster parents across the state and said, "All right, three biggest biggest things you would want me to talk about today." Um, and text after text was, "We're tired. We're really tired. We're weary." It's been a long couple of years as a foster family. There are things happening that uh, point to DCS, um, their lack of staffing, and my goodness, we need to take care of those social workers. They're working so hard, right? So not to, this is not a disparaging comment towards DCS because we love them and we're supporting them, but their workers are tired as well. And we're not taking care of our social workers and our foster parents, and they're all drowning right now. So how do we, how do we bolster our support, not just for the foster parents, but for the social workers to better care for these kids? Um, they have all sorts of responses. You should know if you text a bunch of foster mamas who are fierce advocates, they're gonna give you all sorts of things you should say today. Uh, but a lot of it was around the, the support systems, uh, around daycares and schools, and where can they get support for their kiddos? Where can they go that understands their kids? Where, what schools, what uh, therapists are trauma-informed that really understands kids they brought to their home, um, and how are we supporting those families? Um, I'd say communication. Uh, it was one of the biggest gaps um, throughout the entire process before your home is over, um, is communicating, communicating with whoever your case manager is going to be, and then once your home is open, um, having good communication amongst each of the county's uh, primary placement um, individuals, um, mm -hmm. and how they communicate with you. Um, from a timeline standpoint is often difficult to plan for, um, right? So, so for someone like me who has three biological children, um, and you surprise me with that, hey, you've got three additional kids you want to put in the house. Communicating with me on the front end would be easier than getting surprises later in the week. Yeah. I'm so glad you said that, because that, that's what came to my mind, was just having the time to thoroughly explain the process, both for the foster family, but also for the biological family. Uh, you know, there's a lot that happens that, as professionals, it's challenging to navigate. So for a foster family, that the child welfare system is a new experience, but also for a biological parent whose child has come into care, it's very difficult to know what's happening and what, what decisions are in front of you. And so I think, allowing for us to have the ability to educate families and communicate with foster families as to what's next and what to expect is really helpful. But to your point, Kristen, most of our families really struggle with the idea of 
having enough people to wrap around them. You know, we, we do the very best we can to support our families, but it goes beyond that. You know, schools need to understand the challenges that some of our youth are facing, but also the understanding of our foster families. I spoke with a foster family in our rural area that recently, unfortunately, had to disrupt a pre-adoptive placement in her home, and her biggest challenge was working with a smaller school system and then understanding that she was doing everything she could, but there were still going to be behavioral challenges. And let's, let's work through this together, let's not give up, and it ended up with, uh, you know, this child unfortunately having to change placement. So I think it, it takes all of us. Hi, and I wrote too many questions, but I'm gonna uh, piggyback on a couple of those, starting with uh, this last item, Brittany. So the, that example that you gave with the foster parents, small county and school system, like, I imagine it's behavioral questions, right? That's largely the result of trauma. We talked about trauma in the last panel. Absolutely applies here. What are what are these kids who come into foster care? What what trauma have they experienced? What are they currently experiencing and what will they experience experience going forward? And how are we dealing with that? What do we need to do to address that issue? Our last thoughts will tell you story real quick. I was with a foster parent this week. I was actually with Jerry up in Bristol, Tennessee, and this foster mom was sharing, she has an adoption date coming November 9th, and she's adopting a little boy that Tennessee Kids Belong filmed. Um, he really stood out to me during the filming, he was hilarious. Uh, had a, our whole team laughing. So we've shared his video many times, he's gotten so many inquiries, and foster mom was sharing that it's been really, really challenging, and that now that he's in a place where he sees permanency is like right around the corner, like it's in nine days, eight days now, um, some of the behaviors are starting to come out um, even more intensely than they were before. She shared something that I didn't know, and that was that he had had 24 placements. Okay, He's 17 years old. He's been in 24 homes. Half of those homes had told him, we will adopt you. They were pre-adopted homes, right? This is not to shame those families. That might not have been the right fit for him, and I, I am so grateful he is where he's at. Um, but she said he's not 17 and a half. You know, he's developmentally so far behind. And the kids at his school and the teachers just don't understand him. And as an adoptive mom, she has one other boy that was adopted, she said, I'm now having to figure out what does 18 look like for him? Because I don't know if he can hold a job. I'm worried about him holding a job because I, I see his behaviors at home and I, and I know he's just a little boy and we're having to go back and we're gonna have to treat him and care for him like the nine-year-old little boy that he is internally, right? Outside, he's great, he's amazing, he's so funny, he would make you all laugh. Um, but we're seeing that play out, and she's going to do a lifetime with him. Um, his name is Lance, be thinking about him on November 9th, it'll be a big day, he's got a whole speech planned. Um, but they've got a long road ahead of him, and so ensuring that those services are not only in now when he is in the foster care system and post-adoption, but he's going to need services lifelong, as will that family. They've experienced significant trauma in their care for him, um, and his brother that was also adopted through foster care. Um, I'd say one of the bigger um, gaps we saw once we brought the, the three children to the home was that there was a lack of um, therapy immediately for the child, right? And so that's a tough time for the parent and a tough time for the children because they're uh, they're in a state of fear because they're in a new place, right? They're in a new place with new people who could have the same habits um, that caused them to be out of their original placement. And so ensuring that therapy. Um, is set up on that front, and I think is integral <clears throat> to aiding in that trauma, right? Aiding and allowing that trauma to start to process that trauma sooner, rather than have you know three weeks of bed waiting because they haven't had someone to really engage with who's going to be where they are mm -hmm. and try to help them, try to think through that in a way that just a foster parent can't because they're not skilled in the art of their they're not counseled this year or on you, but how to do that well requires a different type of skill from a, from a, a therapist, and so ensuring that we can engage with those traumas sooner in a placement, I think will be to the benefit of the kids in the foster care system. Do you, I don't have this question written down, but I just, <clears throat> this conversation has made me think some more. Do we, when we're intervening in a child's life in a, in a situation, when we intervene, how much difference does it make at the point that we, that we make that intervention? How much difference does that make? You, I mean, you're, you're a practitioner, I don't push on the spot, but. I, I mean, it's of the utmost importance. I think one of the things that 
we can do better is identifying and intervening earlier, and that's why prevention services are so important. At the end of the day, what we want is to prevent kids from coming into care and for their families to be able to take care of them in a safe environment. But unfortunately, that's not always the case, hence the need for foster care and adoption from foster care, but being able to have access to high quality early intervention can change the course of someone's life and prevent the trauma of removal and the trauma of potentially 24 placements. Can I ask a quick question on that? Is there funding available for, um, I work for a counseling center, is there funding available for counseling centers to pay any type of a rate? Like if we have therapists that are willing to be like, hey, this kid got placed this day, I just didn't know if there was any type of funding that anybody knows about like, hey, we have this much money, that if you have people, you know, we can pay $30 or $50, because we have people that would be willing to do that, but um, I just didn't know, I just want to kind of put that out there for people that are in yeah. private practice or private practice collaboratives. If there was grants we could apply for or something mm -hmm. like that, that makes sense. Yeah. I'm not aware of uh, specific grants for that. Uh, kids that enter state's custody are on tin care, and so um, you know if practitioners accept tin care, then they're able to be reimbursed through tin care. Mm -hmm. um, I think the challenge in general is just the availability of services across the board. Right. So sometimes have a little more flexibility in that. So I was just wondering if that was something. Absolutely. Another uh, opportunity is through Treatment Foster Care, which is offered in Tennessee. Um, you know, there's a number of agencies that provide therapeutic services in the home, and that's services for both the family and for the youth. Um, again, there's a network of private providers across the state of Tennessee, and that is foster parents that certify as a treatment foster parent. And those children typically um, have an assessment upon entry that deem them in need of additional services. However, all kids in custody need services. Yeah. And that's treatment yeah. foster care? Correct. Yeah. Google that. Therapeutic foster care. Um, and I, I think there are potentially some funding mechanisms in the future, but I wouldn't know what the current state is. Yeah, we just have some flexibility, I think, more yeah. than, you know, eight to five agencies, right. so we wanted to right. make sure that was clear. Um, I, yeah, we've got about seven minutes left on this panel. I think um, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about what happens with kids who age out, right? The um, we, we know we can measure, a child who's in foster care, we know we can measure them against their peers in K-12 education, right? And we know they underperform significantly. I mean, maybe, maybe a quarter of the way their peers perform uh, in school, that's for a variety of reasons, but if, say Lance had not gotten adopted, right? What does his, a person in that situation, not specifically, but what does uh, a person in that situation who ages out of the system without finding permits, what, can we measure their outcome? Yeah, I mean, there's a whole wheel of social things, right? We talked about incarceration, crisis pregnancy, um, having a child that goes back into the system, um, the high percentage of sex trafficking victims who've come out of foster care, or out of group homes, age up. I mean, you talk about every social wound in society, and foster care is this feeder, right, to all of them. And a lot of what we're hoping to see is, is churches and business groups and people recognizing the, the foster care to prison pipeline, there's some great articles about that, and saying, hey, we're gonna go upstream uh, because we don't wanna have to keep supporting the need for so many of these ministries. I don't wanna see the Lances or you know the other kids who age out because the, the statistics are just staggering, right? And I don't even like saying them all because I don't like speaking right. that over each of these kids. But I, the other day, we, oh, real quick, um, a young lady that we filmed did age out. We filmed her right before she turned 17, or right before she turned 18, I'm sorry. And she found her video on Facebook and she reshared it and she said, Look, this was so cute. You know, this got me and I didn't find a family and we're just heartbroken. So, being the social workers that we are, we snooped, right? And it was like a checklist that just broke our team's heart. She was pregnant, talking about how she had no food, no clothing, didn't know what she was going to do with her pregnancy. Uh, the father was incarcerated, borderline homeless, sleeping couch to couch. I mean, you just went down the list. It was like, shoot. This, this is so real, and we can talk stats all day long, but I'm seeing it today on the screen, and it's breaking our heart. So we've got to go upstream. Yeah. I have to mention the hope in, in what we do here in Tennessee, and one thing that we 
do well as we have a pretty robust private-public partnership with the Department of Children's Services that offers extension of foster care services to youth that are aging out of the system. We also have the LifeSet program, which Youth Villages provides and was part of the largest randomized controlled study with this population to show vast improvements in multiple domains. So while the outcomes are unfortunate for many young people that have experienced foster care and aged out without permanency, you know, I have to highlight that, you know, these are, these are young people that are extremely resilient and Tennessee sees and invests in that resiliency to ensure that for those youth that are unable to find permanency still have access to resources to help them to be as successful as possible. I could talk all day and to dive into all these little things that we've talked about so far from the services to health care to child care to the things that foster parents need, foster kids need, but there are a handful of topics I wanted to hit really quickly. One is around technology, JR, technology expert. If you could, two minutes, kind of, if we had time and resources and flexibility, what really could we do with the technology solution? To foster you stretch my three minutes to two I know, minutes. I'm sorry. I didn't, they did. <laughs> I'll make it quick. Um, I think if, if we could have uh, some way for the process to be more transparent, so even if there was a timeline, a calendar um, that the uh, potential foster families could log into to see kind of where things were in the progress of them getting their home open, and once it was open, a timeline for the children to understand what court dates are going to happen, mm -hmm. when visits are anticipated to be planned, um, if the DCS workers were able to log into a system to see that you had placements, right? So when our house is full, and we still get calls on day of like, hey, can you take, you know, two 17-year-old males? Like, well, no, we've got six kids in the house. We wouldn't take two 17-year-old males. But, so we're probably not the right family for you, but the DCS workers didn't have access to that information readily. So that if, if we could just find a mechanism for them to log into that application, make their days more simple, I think it would help not only the DCS workers, but also help the foster parents. Mm -hmm. Every time I get that message, it's tugging my heart. That's why I'm doing this, right? And so I'd love to just, there's some, some really practical things that I've walked with them with you last time we got together that would take more than two minutes to talk about. I think would be really beneficial to make the, the process a lot more simple for both DCS, the kids, and the families. I like it. Um, if each of you kind of a rapid fire, if you could implement one big change in public policy, what would it be? Like, what would the one thing you would do is like, if I could wave magic wand and do one thing. It would be. Uh, well, I think one, the investment in prevention is a tremendous investment that will impact all other facets of child welfare. Um, but then also, again, we've talked a lot about timeliness to permanency. And I think that that also has a tremendous impact on outcomes. And so ensuring that we have continuity of care within a timeline so that we can achieve permanency more quickly and provide support once permanency is achieved because it's not a magic bullet. It's not gonna change everything. It's like turning 18, the world doesn't fall at your feet. So it's important that there's um, funding and available services on an ongoing basis. I'd say um, uh, the technology, I don't wanna say people process and technology. Um, if the people running it are in need if they're tired or fatigued and they're underfunded and under resourced and we need to help them give them investment there. If the process is flawed and it's slow, it's inefficient, um, we need to focus and give resources to the process and technology, but there's just no technology actually. Um, so there should be some technology that makes this process easier. So I say if I could major wave a magic wand, I would fund the people process and technology involved with fostering. I love some of the policies we've talked about um, on our committee around home study sharing and all these things that I could get into, but they all feed up to the same thing. And, and to me, that's the idea that a good family is better than any great program. We're spending a lot of time making sure we've got all these programs to serve these kids, but expediting the timeliness of getting kids into families and that family to permanency is going to be better than any program we can provide or wrap around helping you know, support them through social workers. Or so you alluded to what? What what do we do to get more good for your foster parent? Like you guys, what do we do to get more good foster parents? What what drives them? What helps? 
think education. I think a lot of people in the community are getting really frustrated. Like, we hear this need, we're hearing you say you need more families, but then we go and it's, we're not the right fit, or we only can foster up to age five, or what are some of those barriers? And so really educating the community um, and equipping them to, to meet the needs of what's going on in their exact community. It's not the same in every region and every county across the state. We've got staff in all 12 regions, and they all come together and we hear different things. Mm -hmm. uh, and so making sure that each region is equipped to educate their community on the needs specific there. Um, and then I'm all about public-private partnerships. It's the heartbeat of Tennessee Kids Belong, so talk about that for a long time. I think it's the people in our communities needs to do what God has called us to do with what he blesses with. Um, mm -hmm. Your five bedroom home, that extra room can be a room for a child. Right? Yeah. And so that's the conversation my wife and I had was, let's use what God has blessed us with in order to bestow that upon other people. So that's why we open our home and let it be open until... You sure you're not a preacher? I am not. <laughs> I am not. Amplifying foster parent voices. I think yeah. that's the message that resonates. Mm -hmm. And uh, putting foster parents in the forefront, mm -hmm. having them make decisions about what's going to impact their ability to foster. Um, yeah. Putting you in the driver's seat. Making sure they have a voice in court and everything that's going on with those kids. Yeah. I said I was going to try to get us out of here by 11, and I'm pushing up against it. But before I, uh, but before we do it, I am going to ask you guys the one, the one question that's hard on us. Not, hopefully not hard on you, but hard on us. And that is when, when my pastor says, Jeremy, what can we do? What's the answer? What should I tell them? Get rid of your idol of convenience and comfort. What you said, When they ask me for what service should we provide, what should I tell them? <laughs> so, so I would say this. Okay. Uh, there's a, there's a new app called Foster Friendly um, that's developed by Tennessee Kids Belong, America's Kids Belong, and churches across the country are saying, what are the best practices? And so we've been partnering with organizations all over the country, right, that are doing really great work. And the three best practices that have been identified is talk about this, but, but do some education before you talk about this, right? Meet with your local social workers, find out the need, listen, because the churches are so well-intentioned sometimes. But when there's this mismatch of well intentions not meeting the actual needs, the social workers are like, thank you, but we don't need 300 toothbrushes, but thanks for doing a toothbrush drive, right? So partnering with your local social workers and asking the questions, what do you need us to say from the pulpit? How do we actually talk about these kids? How do we do it appropriately, right? So educate your community, build wraparound support. That can look like organic, you know, ministries forming, that could be a whole department of a church, but making sure that if a family answers that calling on their heart to say, yes, we feel called to open up our hearts and homes to vulnerable kids in our community, they're going to have a group of people that come around them. We do not want them showing up to church on a Sunday feeling super isolated, feeling like the Sunday uh, ministry teams don't know how to handle their child who shows up with complex trauma. So building that wraparound support for those families to be there for them so they are not doing this alone. And then really educating your church staff and all of your volunteers on trauma so that when they show up on a Sunday, those parents might actually be able to sit in the service in their house of worship and experience that break and not be called back and forth constantly because the church staff doesn't know how or the volunteers don't know how to navigate. Uh, complex trauma showing up in Sunday school. So teach on it, make sure you are building support. We feel that it's irresponsible to recruit new foster families without simultaneously recruiting that support yeah. for them mm -hmm. and make sure your church is trauma trained. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Like, I got that. Yeah. Very Did passionate us, about this. <laughs> all around. Well, thank you guys. Uh, and thanks again to all our panelists and our speakers for being so generous with their time and their thoughts today. Uh, and thank you again to our board members, and uh, I saw Christy Gibbs come in that I missed to uh, serve on our board, and to our committee members who were able to join us, and I saw Felton uh, and Jerry Caldwell uh, were able to join that I missed earlier today. And thank you all for taking your time to be here to talk about this really important topic. I know that you all care deeply about it and are very engaged, uh, and so we're uh, excited about where that's going. I hope that you are leaving here today with a lot more things that you would like to discuss, maybe a list of questions uh, that you would like to ask or learn more about, and maybe some things that you've never considered before. 
I am, and I've been having this conversation for a year now, and we've said, said new things here today. Uh, obviously, we're running a nonprofit, and while this isn't a fundraising event, I would be uh, doing my organization a disservice if I didn't say there's a QR code. If you felt so led to donate on the back, and that's all on your program, and that's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, at the, the end of the year is coming up pretty quickly, and that means that the legislative session is approaching very quickly in January, which means that even more attention will get brought to these issues as bills get filed to address specific problems or issues or concerns or to help meet a particular need or goal. I think Senator Hale and Joseph Budson and some of the other guys said that you are a really important piece of that process. Right? You have a voice. Uh, I know from experience, uh, both with, uh, in my time in the previous administration and with the current administration and uh, with the General Assembly, that these, they're not looking to get to their own answer, they're trying to get to the right answer. And your voice as part of that process is really, really important. So I hope that you will stay engaged in that and help us kind of shape public policy so we really can make this uh, the best place to put your family through adoption and foster care and make sure that every child has a safe, loving, and permanent family. I hope that you'll take back what you've heard today, that you'll think about it, and that you'll reach back out to us uh, and let us know your thoughts, things that you would challenge, things that you would agree with or expand upon. Our website, adoptionfriendly.org, there is uh, on the contact page, there's a form you can fill out. That doesn't go to some random inbox, it comes directly to me. Uh, so I see it, and Jennifer and I uh, we'll, we'll be able to talk about it and share it and make sure that you get a response, uh, hopefully in a, in a timely manner, and we can uh, further engage on that. As I said at the very start, my hope was that this is the beginning of a public conversation that continues uh, at the intersection where public policy meets our purpose. And we fully intend to have discussions like this in the future uh, on a variety of topics and hopefully have some more time to dive in more deeply on foster care specifically, private adoption specifically, the kind of supports in mental health care uh, that we need to be thinking about. Um, one last thing, if you need, uh, in addition to that form on our website, you can grab Jennifer or myself as this is uh, ending and we can give you a business card with our direct content. It's got our cell phone and our uh, email on it, so feel free to reach out there. Again, I'm going to say thank you to everybody for coming. I know some of you drove a long way and even, I know at least one person came in from, from D.C to be here this morning. Uh, so from all over the state and from Washington, D.C. at least, thank you for coming, and I hope you can enjoy the rest of the state. <laughs>